This is pages 140 to 154 of The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. As we read today, look for what problems are caused in this section and how they are solved. Page 140. When we all got home that afternoon, Mom and Dad were eager to hear about our first day. It was good, I said. I didn't want to tell Mom the truth. I was in no mood to hear one of her lectures about the power of positive thinking. See, she said, I told you you'd fit right in. Ryan shrugged off Mom and Dad's questions, and Lori didn't want to talk about her day at all. How are the other kids? I asked her later. Okay, she said, but she turned away, and that was the end of the conversation. The bullying continued every day for weeks. The tall girl, whose name was Denisha Hewitt, watched me with her smile while we all waited on the asphalt playground for classes to start. At lunch, I ate my lard sandwiches with paralytic slowness, but sooner or later, the janitor started putting the chairs up on the tables. I walked outside trying to hold my head high, and Denisha and her gang surrounded me, and it began. As we fought, they called me poor and ugly and dirty, and it was hard to argue the point. I had three dresses to my name, all hand-me-downs or from a thrift store, which meant each week I had to wear two of them twice. They were so worn from countless washings that the threads were beginning to separate. We were also always dirty. Not dry dirty like we'd been in the desert, but grimy dirty and smudged with oily dust from the coal-burning stove. Irma allowed us only one bath a week in four inches of water that had been heated on the kitchen stove and that all of us kids had to share. I thought of discussing the fighting with Dad, but I didn't want to sound like a whiner. Also, he'd rarely been sober since we arrived in Welch, and I was afraid that if I told him, he'd show up at school snockered and make things even worse. I did try to talk to Mom. I couldn't bring myself to tell her about the beatings, fearing that if I did, she'd try to butt in, and she'd also only make things worse. I did say that these three black girls were giving me a hard time because we were so poor. Mom told me I should tell them there was nothing wrong with being poor that Abraham Lincoln, the greatest president this country had ever seen, came from a dirt-poor family. She also said I should tell them that Martin Luther King Jr. would be ashamed of their behavior. Even though I knew these high-minded arguments would get me nowhere, I tried them anyway. Martin Luther King would be ashamed, and they made the three girls shriek with laughter as they pushed me to the ground. Lying in Stanley's bed at night with Lori, Brian, and Maureen, I concocted revenge scenarios. I imagined myself like Dad in his Air Force days, whooping the entire lot of them. After school, I'd go out to the woodpile next to the basement and practice karate chops and drop kicks on the kindling while laying down some pretty wicked curse words. But I also kept thinking about Denisha, trying to make sense of her. I hoped for a while to befriend her. I'd seen Denisha smile a few times with genuine warmth, and it transformed her face. With a smile like that, she had to have some good in her, but I couldn't figure out how to get her to shine it my way. About a month after I'd started school, I was walking up some steps to a park at the top of the hill when I heard a low, furious barking coming from the other side of the World War I memorial. I ran up the stairs and saw a big, lathered-up mongrel cornering a little black kid of about five or six against the monument. The kid kept giving kicks at the dog as it barked and lunged at him. The kid was looking over at the tree line on the far side of the park, and I could tell he was calculating the chances of making it over there. "'Don't run!' I shouted. The boy looked up at me, so did the dog, and in that instant, the kid took off in a hopeless dash for the trees. The dog bounded after him, barking, then caught up with him and snapped at his legs. Now, there are mad dogs, and wild dogs, and killer dogs, and any one of them would go for your throat and hold on until you or it was dead, but I could tell this dog was not truly bad. Instead of tearing into the kid, it was having fun terrifying him, growling and pulling on his pant leg, but doing no real damage. It was just some mutt who had been kicked around too much and was happy to find a creature who was afraid of it. I picked up a stick and raced toward them. Go on now, I shouted at the dog. When I raised the stick, it whimpered and slunk off. The dog's teeth had not broken the boy's skin, but his pant leg was torn and he was trembling as if he had palsy. I offered to take him home and I ended up carrying him piggyback. He was feather light. I couldn't get a word out of him except the most minimal directions. Up there, that way, in a voice I could hardly hear. The houses in the neighborhood were old but freshly painted, some in bright colors like lavender or kelly green. This here, the boy whispered when we came to a house with blue shutters. It had a neat yard but was so small that dwarves could have lived there. When I put the kid down, he dashed up the steps and through the door. I turned to go. 
Denisha Hewitt was standing on the porch across the street, looking at me curiously. The next day, when I went out to the playground after lunch, the gang of girls started toward me, but Denisha hung back. Without their leader, the others lost their sense of purpose and stopped short of me. The following week, Denisha asked me for help on an English assignment. She never said she was sorry for the bullying or even mentioned it, but she thanked me for bringing her neighbor home that night, and I figured that her request for help was as close to an apology as I would get. Irma had made it clear how she felt about black people, so instead of inviting Denisha to our house to work on her assignment, I suggested that on the upcoming Saturday, I'd go to hers. That day, I was leaving the house at the same time as Uncle Stanley. He never had the wherewithal to learn to drive, but someone from the appliance store where he worked was picking him up. He asked if I wanted a ride, too. When I told him where he was headed, he frowned. That's Enville, he said. What are you going there for? Stanley didn't want his friend to drive me there, so I walked. When I got back home later in the afternoon, the house was empty except for Irma, who never set foot outside. She stood in the kitchen, stirring a pot of green beans and taking swigs from the bottle of hooch in her pocket. So how was Enville? she asked. Irma was always going on about the N-words. Her and Grandpa's house was on Court Street, on the edge of the black neighborhood. It galled her when they started moving into that section of town, and she always said it was their fault that Welch had gone downhill. When you were sitting in the living room, where Irma always kept the shades drawn, you could hear groups of black people walking into town, talking and laughing. Goddamn N-words, Irma always muttered. The reason I have not gone out of this house in 15 years is because I don't want to see or be seen by an N-word. Mom and Dad had always forbidden us to use that word. It was much worse than any curse word, they told us. But since Irma was my grandmother, I never said anything when she used it. Irma kept stirring the beans. Keep this up and people are going to think you're an N-word lover, she said. She gave me a serious look, as if imparting a meaningful life lesson I should ponder and absorb. She unscrewed the cap from her bottle of hooch and took a long, contemplative swallow. As I watched her drinking, I felt this pressure building in my chest, and I had to let it out. You're not supposed to use that word, I said. Irma's face went slack with astonishment. Mom says they're just like us, I continued, except they have different complexions. Irma glared at me. I thought she was going to backhand me, but instead she said, You ungrateful little shit. I'll be damned if you're eating my food tonight. Get your worthless ass down to the basement. Lori gave me a hug when she heard I'd told off Irma. Mom was upset, though. We may not agree with all of Irma's views, she said, but we have to remember that as long as we're her guests, we have to be polite. That didn't seem like Mom. She and Dad happily railed against anyone they disliked or disrespected, standard oil executives, J. Edgar Hoover, and especially snobs and racists. They'd always encouraged us to be outspoken about our opinions. Now we were supposed to bite our tongues, but she was right. Irma would boot us. Situations like these, I realized, were what turned people into hypocrites. You hate Irma, I told Mom. You have to show compassion for her, Mom said. Irma's parents had died when she was young, Mom explained, and she'd been shipped off to one relative after another who had treated her like a servant. Scrubbing clothes on a washboard until her knuckles bled, that was the preeminent memory of Irma's childhood. The best thing Grandpa did for her when they got married was buy her an electric washing machine, but whatever joy it had once given her was long gone. Irma can't let go of her misery, Mom said. It's all she knows. She added that you should never hate anyone, even your worst enemies. Everyone has something good about them, she said. You have to find this redeeming quality and love the person for that. Oh yeah? I said. How about Hitler? What was his redeeming quality? Hitler loved dogs, Mom said, without hesitation. In late winter, Mom and Dad decided to drive the Oldsmobile back to Phoenix. They said they were going to fetch our bikes and all the other stuff we'd had to leave behind, pick up copies of our school records, and see if they could rescue Mom's fruitwood archery set from the irrigation ditch alongside the road to the Grand Canyon. We kids were to remain in Welch. Since Lori was the oldest, Mom and Dad said she was in charge. Of course, we were all answerable to Irma. They left one morning during a thaw. I could tell by the high color in Mom's cheeks that she was excited about the prospect of an adventure. Dad was also clearly itching to get out of Welch. He had not found a job, and we were dependent on Irma for everything. 
Lori had suggested that Dad go to work in the mines, but he said the mines were controlled by the unions, and the unions were controlled by the mob, and the mob had blackballed him for investigating corruption in the electrician's union back in Phoenix. Another reason for him to return to Phoenix was to gather his research on corruption, because the only way he could get a job in the mines was by helping reform the United Mine Workers of America. I wished we were all going together. I wanted to be back in Phoenix, sitting under the orange trees behind our adobe house, riding my bike to the library, eating free bananas in a school where the teachers thought I was smart. I wanted to feel the desert sun on my face and breathe in the dry desert air and climb the steep rock mountains while Dad led us on one of the long hikes that he called geological survey expeditions. I asked if we could all go, but Dad said he and Mom were making a quick trip, strictly business, and we kids would only get in the way. Besides, he, he couldn't go taking us out of school in the middle of the year. I pointed out that it had never bothered him before. Welch wasn't like those other places we had lived, he said. There were rules that had to be followed, and people didn't take it kindly when you flouted them. Do you think they'll come back? Brian asked as Mom and Dad drove off. Of course, I said, though I had been wondering the same thing. These days we seemed more of an inconvenience than we used to be. Lori was already a teenager, and in a couple of years, Brian and I would be too. They couldn't toss us into the back of a U-Haul or put us in cardboard boxes at night. Brian and I started running after the Oldsmobile. Mom turned once and waved, and Dad stuck his hand out the window. We followed them all the way down to Court Street, where they picked up speed and then turned the corner. I had to believe they'd come back, I told myself. If I didn't believe, then they might not return. They might leave us. Forever. After Mom and Dad left, Irma became even more cantankerous. If she didn't like the look on our faces, she would hit us on the head with a serving spoon. Once she pulled out a framed photograph of her father and told us he was the only person who had ever loved her. She talked on and on about how much she'd suffered as an orphan at the hands of her aunts and uncles who hadn't treated her half as kindly as she was treating us. About a week after Mom and Dad left, we kids were all sitting in Irma's living room watching TV. Stanley was sleeping in the foyer. Irma, who'd been drinking since breakfast, told Brian that his britches needed mending. He started to take them off, but Irma said she didn't want him running around the house in his skivvies or with a towel wrapped around him looking like he was wearing a goddamn dress. It would be easier for her to mend the britches while he was still wearing them. She ordered him to follow her into Grandpa's bedroom, where she kept her sewing kit. They'd been gone for a minute or two when I heard Brian weakly protesting. I went into Grandpa's bedroom and saw Irma kneeling on the floor in front of Brian, grabbing at the crotch of his pants, squeezing and kneading while mumbling to herself and telling Brian to hold still, goddammit. Brian, his cheeks wet with tears, was holding his hands protectively between his legs. Irma, you leave him alone, I shouted. Irma, still on her knees, twisted around and glared at me. Why, you little bitch, she said. Lori heard the commotion and came running. I told Lori that Irma was touching Brian in a way she ought not to be. Irma said she was merely mending Brian's inseam and that she shouldn't have to defend herself against some lying little whore's accusations. I know what I saw, I said. She's a pervert. Irma reached over to slap me, but Lori caught her hand. Let's all calm down, Lori said in the same voice she used when Mom and Dad got carried away, arguing. Everybody, calm down. Irma jerked her hand out of Lori's grasp and slapped her so hard that Lori's glasses went flying across the room. Lori, who had turned 13, slapped her back. Irma hit Lori again, and this time, Lori struck Irma a blow in the jaw. Then they flew at each other, tussling and flailing and pulling hair, locked together, with Brian and me cheering on Lori until we woke up Uncle Stanley, who staggered into the room and pushed them apart. Irma relegated us to the basement after that. A door in the basement led directly outside, so we never went upstairs. We weren't even allowed to use Irma's bathroom, which meant we either had to wait for school or go outside after dark. Uncle Stanley sometimes sneaked down beans he'd boiled for us, but he was afraid if he stayed talking, Irma would think he'd taken our side and get mad at him too. The following week, a storm hit. The temperature dropped, and a foot of snow fell on Welsh. Irma wouldn't let us use any coal. She said we didn't know how to operate the stove and would burn the house down, and it was so cold in the basement that Lori, Brian, Maureen, and I were glad we all shared one bed. As soon as we got home from school, we'd climb under the covers with our clothes on and do our homework there. We were in bed the night Mom and Dad came back. We didn't hear the sound of the car pulling up. 
All we heard was the front door opening upstairs, the mom and dad's voices, and Irma beginning the long narrative of her grievances against us. That was followed by the sound of dad stomping down the stairs into the basement, furious at all of us, me for backtalking Irma and making wild accusations, Lori even more for daring to strike her own grandmother, and Brian for, for being such a pussy and starting the whole thing. I thought dad would come around to our side once he'd heard what had happened, and I tried to explain. I don't care what happened, he yelled, but we were just protecting ourselves, I said. Brian's a man, he can take it, he said. I don't want to hear another word of this. Do you hear me? He was shaking his head, but wildly, almost as if he thought he could keep out the sound of my voice. He wouldn't even look at me. After Dad had gone back upstairs to tie into Irma's hooch, and we kids were all in bed, Brian bit my toe to try to make me laugh, but I kicked him away. We all lay there in the silent darkness. Dad was really weird, I said, because someone had to say it. You'd be weird, too, if Irma was your mom, Lori said. Do you think she ever did something to Dad, like what she did to Brian? I asked. No one said a thing. It was gross and creepy to think about, but it would explain a lot. Why Dad left home as soon as he could, why he drank so much, and why he got so angry, why he never wanted to visit Welch when we were younger, why he at first refused to come to West Virginia with us, and only at the last possible moment overcame his reluctance and jumped into the car. Why he was shaking his head so hard, almost like he wanted to put his hands over his ears when I tried to explain what Irma had been doing to Brian. Don't think about things like that, Lori told me. It'll make you crazy. And so, I put it out of my mind. Page 149. Mom and Dad told us how they'd make it to Phoenix only to find that Mom's laundry on the clothesline ploy hadn't kept out intruders. Our house on North 3rd Street had been looted. Pretty much everything was gone, including, of course, our bikes. Mom and Dad had rented a trailer to carry back what little was left. Mom said those foolish thieves had overlooked some good stuff, such as a pair of Grandma Smith's riding breeches from the 30s that were of the highest quality. But the Oldsmobile's engine had seized up in Nashville, and they'd had to abandon it along with the trailer and Grandma Smith's riding breeches and take the bus the rest of the way back to Welch. I thought that once Mom and Dad returned, they'd be able to make peace with Irma, but she said she could never forgive us kids and didn't want us in her house any longer, even if we stayed in the basement and kept us quiet as church mice. We were banished. That was the word Dad used. You did wrong, he said, and now we've all been banished. This isn't exactly the Garden of Eden, Lori said. I was more upset about the bike than I was about Irma banishing us. Why don't we just move back to Phoenix, I asked. We've already been there, she said, and there are all sorts of opportunities here that we don't even know about. She and Dad set out to find us a new place to live. The cheapest rental in Welch was an apartment over a diner on McDowell Street that cost $75 a month, which was out of our price range. Also, Mom and Dad wanted outdoor space we could call our own, so they decided to buy. Since we had no money for a down payment and no steady income, our options were pretty limited, but within a couple of days, Mom and Dad told us they had found a house we could afford. It's not exactly palatial, so there's going to be a lot of togetherness, Mom said. And it's on the rustic side. How rustic? Lori asked. Mom paused. I could see her debating how to phrase her answer. It doesn't have indoor plumbing, she said. Dad was still looking for a car to replace the olds. Our budget was in the high two figures. So that weekend, we all hiked over for our first look at the new place. We walked down the valley toward the center of town and around a mountainside, past the small, tidy brick houses put up after the mines were unionized. We crossed a creek that fed into the Tug River and started up a barely paved one-lane road called Little Hobart Street. It climbed through several switchbacks and, for a stretch, rose at an angle so steep you had to walk on your toes. If you tried walking flat-footed, you stretched your calves till they hurt. The houses up here were shabbier than the brick houses lower down in the valley. They were made of wood, with lopsided porches, sagging roofs, rusted-out gutters, and balding tar paper or asphalt shingles slowly but surely parting from the underwall. In almost every yard, a mutt or two was chained to a tree or to a clothesline post, and they barked furiously as we walked by. Like most houses in Welch, these were heated by coal. The more prosperous families had coal sheds. The poorer ones left their coal in a pile out front. 
The porches were every bit as furnished as the inside of most houses, with rust-stained refrigerators, folding card tables, hook rugs, couches, or car seats for serious porch sitting, and maybe a battered armoire with a hole cut in the side so the cat would have a cozy place to sleep. We followed the road almost to the end, where Dad pointed up at our new house. Well, kids, welcome to 93 Little Hobart Street, Mom said. Welcome to home, sweet home. We all stared. The house was a dinky thing, perched up off the road on a hillside so steep that only the back of the house rested on the ground. The front, including a drooping porch, jutted precariously into the air, supported by tall, spindly, cinderblock pillars. It had been painted white a long time ago, but the paint, where it hadn't peeled off altogether, had turned a dismal gray. It's good we raised you youngins to be tough, Dad said, because this is not a house for the faint of heart. Dad led us up the lower steps, which were made of rocks slapped together with cement. Because of settling and erosion and downright slipshod construction, they tilted dangerously toward the street. Where the stone steps ended, a rickety set of stairs made from two-by-fours, more like a ladder than a staircase, took you up to the front porch. Inside were three rooms, each about ten feet by ten feet, facing onto the front porch. The house had no bathroom, but underneath it, behind one of the cinder block pillars, was a closet-sized room with a toilet on a cement floor. The toilet wasn't hooked up to any sewer or septic system. It just sat atop a hole about six feet deep. There was no running water indoors. A water spigot rose a few inches above the ground, near the toilet, so you could get a bucket and tote water upstairs. While the house was wired for electricity, Dad confessed that we could not, at the moment, afford to have it turned on. On the upside, Dad said, the house had cost only $1,000 and the owner had waived the down payment. We were supposed to pay him $50 a month. If we could make the payments on time, we'd own the place outright in under two years. Hard to believe that one day this will all be ours, said Lori. She was developing what Mom called a bit of a sarcastic streak. Count your blessings, Mom said. There are people in Ethiopia who would kill for a place like this. She pointed out that the house did have some attractive features. For example, in the living room was a cast iron, pot-bellied coal stove for heating and cooking. It was big and handsome, with heavy bear claw feet, and she was certain it was valuable if you took it to a place where people appreciated antiques. But since the house had no chimney, the stovepipe vented out a back window. Someone had replaced the glass in the upper part of the window with plywood and wrapped tinfoil around the opening to keep the coal smoke from leaking into the room. The tinfoil had not done its job too well, and the ceiling was black with soot. Someone, probably the same someone, had also made the mistake of trying to clean the ceiling in a few spots, but had ended up only smudging and smearing the soot, creating whitish patches that made you realize how black the rest of the ceiling was. The house itself isn't much, Dad apologized, but we won't be living in it long. The important thing, the reason he and Mom had decided to acquire this particular piece of property, was that it came with plenty of land to build our new house. He planned to get to work on it right away. He intended to follow the blueprints for the glass castle, but he had to do some serious reconfiguring and increase the size of the solar cells to take into account that since we were on the north face of the mountain and enclosed by hills on both sides, we'd hardly ever get any sun. We moved in that afternoon. Not that there was much to move. Dad borrowed a pickup from the appliance store where Uncle Stanley worked and brought back a sofa bed that a friend of Grandpa's was throwing out. Dad also scavenged a couple of tables and chairs, and he built some makeshift closets, which were actually kind of nifty, by hanging lengths of pipe from the ceiling with wires. Mom and Dad took over the room with the stove, and it became a combined living room, master bedroom, art studio, and writer's study. We put the sofa bed there though once we opened it, it never went back to being a sofa. Dad built shelves all along the upper walls to store Mom's art supplies. She set up her easel under the stovepipe, right next to the back window, because she said it got natural sun sunlight, which it did, relatively speaking. She put her typewriters under another window, with shelves for her manuscripts and works in progress, and she immediately started thumbtacking index cards with story ideas to the walls. We kids all slept in the middle room, at first, we shared one big bed that had been left by the previous owner, but Dad decided we were getting a tad old for that. We were also too big to sleep in cardboard boxes, and there wasn't enough room on the floor for them anyway, so we helped Dad build two sets of bunk beds. We made the frames with 2x4s, then we drilled holes in the sides and threaded ropes through. 
For mattresses, we laid cardboard over the ropes. When we finished, our bunk beds looked sort of plain, so we spray-painted the sides with ornate red and black curly cues. Dad came home with a discarded four-drawer dresser, one drawer for each of us. He also built each of us a wooden box with sliding doors for personal stuff. We nailed them on the wall above our beds, and that was where I kept my geode. The third room at 93 Little Hobart Street, the kitchen, was in a category all its own. It had an electric stove, but the wiring was not exactly up to code, with faulty connectors, exposed lines, and buzzy switches. Helen Keller must have wired this damn house, Dad declared. He decided it was too convoluted to bother fixing. We called the kitchen the loose juice room, because on the rare occasions that we had paid the electricity bill and had power, we'd get a wicked electric shock if we touched any damp or metallic surface in the room. The first time I got zapped, it knocked my breath out and left me twitching on the floor. We quickly learned that whenever we ventured into the kitchen, we needed to wrap our hands in the driest socks or rags we could find. If we got a shock, we'd announce it to everyone else, sort of like giving a weather report. Big jolt from touching the stove today, we'd say. Wear extra rags. One corner of the kitchen ceiling leaked like a sieve. Every time it rained, the plasterboard ceiling would get all swollen and heavy, with water streaming steadily from the center of the bulge. During one particularly fierce rainstorm that spring, the ceiling grew so fast it burst, and water and plasterboard came crashing down onto the floor. Dad never repaired it. We kids tried patching the roof on our own with tar paper, tinfoil, wood, and elm roost glue, but no matter what we did, the water found its way through. Eventually we gave up. So every time it rained outside, it rained in the kitchen, too. At first, Mom tried to make living at 93 Little Hobart Street seem like an adventure. The woman who had lived there before us left behind an old-fashioned sewing machine that you operated with a foot treadle. Mom said it would come in handy because we could make our own clothes, even when the electricity was turned off. She also claimed you didn't need patterns to sew. You could get creative and wing it. Shortly after we moved in, Mom, Lori, and I measured one another and tried to make our own dresses. It took forever, and they came out baggy and lopsided, with sleeves that were different lengths and armholes in the middle of our backs. I couldn't get mine over my head until Mom snipped out a few stitches. It's stunning, she said. But I told her I looked like I was wearing a big pillowcase with elephant trunks sticking out of the sides. Lori refused to wear hers outdoors or even indoors, and Mom had to agree that sewing wasn't the best use of our creative energy or our money. The cheapest cloth we could find cost 79 cents a yard, and you needed more than two yards for a dress. It made more sense to buy thrift store clothes, and they had the armholes in the right places. Mom also tried to make the house cheerful. She decorated the living room walls with her oil paintings, and soon every square inch was covered except for the space above her typewriter reserved for index cards. We had vivid desert sunsets, stampeding horses, sleeping cats, snow-covered mountains, bowls of fruit, blooming flowers, and portraits of us kids. Since Mom had more paintings than we had wall space, Dad nailed long shelf brackets to the wall, and she hung one picture in front of the other until they were three or four deep. Then she'd rotate the paintings, just a little redecorating to perk the place up, she'd say. But I believe she thought of her paintings as children and wanted them to feel that they were all being treated equally. Mom also bought rows of shelves in the windows and arranged brightly colored bottles to catch the light. Now it looks like we have stained glass, she announced. It did, sort of, but the house was still cold and dank. Every night for the first few weeks, lying on my cardboard mattress and listening to the sound of rainwater dripping in the kitchen, I dreamed of the desert and the sun and the big house in Phoenix with the palm tree in the front and the orange trees and the oleanders in the back. We had owned that house outright. Still owned it, I kept thinking. It was ours, the one true home we'd ever had. Are we ever going home? I asked Dad one day. Home? Phoenix. This is home now.